All righty. Are we ready? Hi, everyone. My name is Asuka Hisa, and I am the ICALA Director of Learning and Engagement. It's my job to welcome you here to tonight's program in conjunction with the exhibition Barbara T. Smith Proof, a remarkable survey. A remarkable survey of the work of Barbara T. Smith, curated by Janelle Porter. You! The show, if I know I had to grab some of you and pull you here, uh, the show's incredible and comprehensive, presenting 60 years of work, ideas, and pioneering performance art gusto. You will see the artist go from homemaker to groundbreaker with her engagement around such issues as spirituality, gender, power, feminist discourse, technology, and new forms of performance as it developed in the West Coast, actually right here in this city. This is the year of Barbara, we've been saying around here. Our exhibition comes after one that took place earlier this year at the Getty Research Institute titled Barbara T. Smith, The Way to Be. The Getty acquired Smith's archive and there, like here, one discovers never before seen things from a trailblazing artistic life. The Getty published uh, Smith's lively memoir titled The Way to Be, which you can buy here over there, <laughs> and ICALA will soon release uh, our exhibition catalog, which will be the most comprehensive publication on the artist. The two books work really well together, and it'll be great in your library. <laughs> Tonight's lecture is by the wonderful Catherine Taft. <laughs> Catherine is deputy director and curator at LAX Art, and she contributed an essay to ICLA's forthcoming catalog. She explores Smith's connection to ecofeminism. Ecofeminism, which Catherine will get into tonight, is part of her current research for a major exhibition of ecofeminist art. She received a research fellowship from the Andy Warhol Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Art for this project, so we have something absolutely amazing to look forward to from Catherine. We've provided much more detailed bio information in the yellow sheets on your, on your seats. So let's proceed with the program. We describe ICALA as a place to gather, learn, and transform with artists and each other. Thank you so much for coming. For Catherine. Uh, thank you, Asuka, and, and thank you so much to Asuka and Tanya and the ICALA for inviting me to speak, and especially to Janelle Porter and Barbara for bringing us this beautiful show. I'm so glad you guys are here tonight so you can get into this and, and tell us more than, than what I'm going to lay out for you. Um, it's such a pleasure to be speaking about this work. I think, you know, Barbara's ecological work is only just starting to be really kind of understood in the full body um, of your, your performance and, and sculpture. And of course, um, there's a lot to talk about. So <laughs> I just want to start out with just a little bit of like, what is feminism? What is ecofeminism? Just so we're all kind of moving with the same um, understanding, but I think I'm among a lot of friends here tonight, so um, you guys can add to this, of course. Simply put, feminism is a movement to end sexism, sexist ex exploitation, and oppression. That's bell hooks. Feminism is for everyone. And I really live by that. Feminism is a tool for everybody. You don't have to be female. You don't have to identify uh, one way or the other. It's really for anyone. So. Um, Lola Olafemi is a younger feminist scholar, and I also really love her definition. Feminism is a political project about what could be. It's always looking forward, invested in futures we can't quite grasp yet. Feminist histories are unwieldy. They cannot and should not be neatly presented. Feminist work is justice work. 
So I think as we see in Barbara's history and Barbara's kind of relationship with, with feminism and as a feminist artist, it can be unwieldy and it can kind of really bring in lots of, of dimensions that um, we are so lucky to kind of still be understanding. So what is ecofeminism? That brings us to this kind of other term that I think really had an academic heyday in the 1980s. Um, there was a bit of backlash against ecofeminism in the 90s for what was thought of as kind of its essentializing nature. So women equal nature, men equal culture. Um, this is a very basic kind of definition that I think we can challenge and get into. Um, but this is sort of the definition I work with. Ecofeminism is a theoretical and activist movement that locates critical connections between gender oppression and the exploitation of natural resources. So there's a lot of kind of um, data <laughs> that you could crunch to kind of make this connection between the exploitation of women and nature. Um, but it's also just a way, it's kind of a very broad umbrella that we can think about different activities in the world. I think with ecofeminism, it can be political, it can be around food, it can be around you know, climate change and, and global warming, it can be around animal rights, forest rights. I mean, it's just so big. Um, and so as ecofeminist art, kind of trying to zero in on what that might be, um, you can do it in many ways. I think one way is to look at the art history. And art historically, ecofeminist art is coming out of, at least in the United States, the anti-nuclear protest movement. So in the early 1980s, women are gathering and they're uh, pretty much around the, the nuclear meltdown of Three Mile Island in the late 70s, I think it's 79. <clears throat> Oh, here's actually another little <laughs> uh, a schematic I'll get to in a moment. But uh, women started rallying together around the meltdown at Three Mile Island, and they had a conference called Women in Life on Earth. And that was really one of the first ecofeminist rallying cries in the United States. And from that, women started to create um, movements. They had protests at the Pentagon, which included like fabulous signage and puppets and kind of started getting into the more aesthetic side of it. Um, and then of course, there is the history of land art and that's sort of another thread that is related to ecofeminist art, but it's really quite different, I think, in sensibility. Um, but first back to, <laughs> to ecofeminism. I think you can see these two schematics very clearly, anthropocentrism on the right with the man on top and the woman and the whale or somehow like <laughs> equivalent. And then of course a kind of ecofeminist worldview would put everybody kind of in relationship um, in this circular, non-hierarchical way. Um, so the term ecofeminism is coined by Francois de Bonne. She's a French theorist, and she is writing in 1974 a book called Feminism or Death. And that's the first time the term ecofeminist is used, and it's only recently been translated into English, actually just 2022, I believe it came out. So you can buy this book on Amazon or wherever now, and... Um, read her, her theories, but in the meantime, A.L. Steiner has been working on this documentary around de Bonn and translating some of the works because it was previously unavailable. Um, so that's why I included this sort of still from Steiner's video. And of course, here's some ephemera from the Women's Pentagon Action, again, like anti-nuclear movements in the United States in the early 1980s. So my students who are here are going to groan because these are my like touch point ecofeminist um, inspiration for my work and my thinking, um, and they've heard this a hundred times, I'm sure. So Vandana Shiva is a physicist, ecofeminist theorist, activist, and she is really working for seed sovereignty and food rights globally. Um, she's really an incredible ecofeminist leader, thinker doing work even now, you know, um, with the UN, with all kinds of organizations. She kind of wrote the book on ecofeminism. <laughs> so in, in the late, early 90s, I think she first publishes a book called Ecofeminism um, that is still available for you all to read. Silvia Federici is an Italian Marxist feminist scholar. She's also really kind of critical, I think, in this, this um, lineage of thinking. She's done incredible work looking at the witchcraft, witchcraft and the witch trials of um, kind of feudal England 
uh, a time that coincides with the rise of capitalism. So as soon as capitalism is being invented, women are being persecuted. And a lot of this is to kind of um, disempower them of land. So the, the enclosure of the commons, not only the commons being actual land, but the enclosure of or, or co-opting of knowledge, forms of knowledge, certainly women's knowledge, um, practices of uh, you know childbirth, death, all the kinds of medicine, healing that, that women were doing at the time in the, in the Middle Ages, um, gets co-opted by the patriarchy right at the rise of capitalism. So she's done really incredible work um, around that. Donna Haraway, also um, an incredible scholar and taught for many, many years in Santa Cruz. Um, this is a still from a documentary about her. Um, but her latest book, Staying with the Trouble, from 2015, really kind of does, undoes a lot of thinking she did in the 80s. Some of you may know the Cyber Feminist Manifesto. Um, she kind of like goes against her own theories of kind of post-humanism to, to really recenter humans and animals and other life forms in what she calls tentacular thinking. So you see the squid and the octopi. Um, I love this, this quote of hers. Nothing connects to everything, but everything is connected to something. So Donna Haraway, eco-feminist thinker, is really thinking about alternate forms of kinship and family and what we can be kind of in relation with um, beyond the human. And lastly, Octavia Butler. You know, I think we all need some sci-fi in the mix as we think about the future and think about other ways of being. Um, <clears throat> you know, Octavia's worlding and storytelling often had strong female figures at the center. She invented a religion called Earthseed in her book, Parable of the Sower, which you might um, say is a ecofeminist religion. Excuse me, I'm just getting over a cold <laughs> as well. Um, yeah, so the focus on futurity. I mean, I think oftentimes the future falls into the hands of women, you know, because, you know, we're constantly doing the work of future building. Um, not that men aren't, but I think at a, at a very basic form of reproductive labor and, and kind of the, the work that a, a female body can do to bring about the future. Um, we have a stake in it, I think. In a, in a very interesting way. Um, so this is just a very kind of graphy, boring slide, but um, I really love that the, the root of economy and the root of ecology are the same. It's oikos, which means a house. So, you know, feminist theory often starts with the domestic space, the space of the home and the space of the house, and who is the keeper of the house historically? Um, it has been women. I think, you know, we're seeing things change, but, um, First wave feminists certainly were reacting against this, the site of the home and, and domesticity. But in this sort of like very basis Marxist system of production, you see capital and the, the sort of site of production, maybe the patriarchy, the men who go off to work is at the top of the triangle. But the base that's supporting that structure is both you know, women and nature. And I think and in a sort of um, Marxist critique of this, you could say that people consider these devalued because they are supposedly endly, endlessly available, um, they can be exploited and never reproduced, so that's when you see you know, the extraction of oil or minerals from the ground. It's, it's like this myth that they're always going to be there, just keeping that, that um, capital up on top. And of course, feminine, feminism undoes this hierarchy. Um, you know, the natural world has always been seen as sort of an aesthetic, passive uh, phenomenon, as have women. I think traditionally in art especially, you think about these landscape paintings of the American West, which are um, these like raw, untouched spaces, um, often painted with vantages from above. So like even thinking in our traditional modes of Western art history, um, nature and art have always kind of been these passive, <coughs> passive subjects. Um, but that brings us to Barbara. I think, you know, that was a really long-winded ecofeminist crash course, <laughs> and I can certainly answer more questions for you. But we're here to talk about Barbara and her many, many examples of work. 
And I was thinking about this piece, Pure Food, um, which was a piece she, a performance she did after an eight hour all night other performance, which had to do with consuming and eating, and there was sort of a psychosexual dimension. And the next day, she simply went out into nature and sat and meditated. Um, this is a field of wild oats she found in Costa Mesa near the ocean, and she was there all day, just kind of bathing in the sun and letting the sun restore her. Um, in many photos of this performance, you don't see that oil <laughs> rig in the background, kind of um, plundering the earth, but I actually really loved this photo because it's right there. I mean, it's, it's the extractive resource of Southern California, um, and she's kind of, you know, in a passive, nonviolent way, just really sitting with all of that. Um, so this is an, earlier, an early piece, but of course there are earlier examples that we'll turn to. Um, so Plots 1970, you know, th again, thinking of that, that triangle with the women's work on the bottom upholding the kind of like man culture on top. Um, you know, that is a, a very oppressive system and to leave that system is a really radical move as it was in the late 60s, early 70s. So Barbara leaves her family structure. She is divorced um, late 60s and then soon makes this piece soon afterwards. You know, that radical shift in the, the kind of nuclear family, family structure, I think really became um, central to her and really a lot of work to come. But Plotz um, particularly, I think, uses the land as a metaphor for this shift and this, this time in her life. Um, if I can just read from her memoir, she writes, recently divorced, I feared I was too privileged and protected to ever survive real life, and I worried about what would happen to me. I set out to demonstrate my fear by planting ground cover seedlings in five separate fields, knowing there were soon to be plowed under. It was like trying to survive a system I barely understood. So here we have one of the, the plots. There were five fields, Costa Mesa, Eagle Rock, Huntington Beach, Newport Beach, and Pasadena. And she plants these little seedlings, as you see here, these kind of like commercially cultivated little plants. Um, in an act of, of kind of like exercising her own cultiv cultivation, you know, her own, own kind of like middle class upbringing to be this good wife and this, this um, you know, a good woman in society, a productive woman in the home. So knowing that this would then be plowed under and removed, you know, it was really a way to kind of exercise that from her system and her identity. This concept makes an appearance again in the late 90s when she again kind of metaphorically embodies the land um, to kind of think about the, the usage of the land and certainly how land is being um, plowed and, and built on and taken over by the expanding city. But here, this piece, Spirit Guide, 1999, has a pointedly ecological message to it. So during the performance, it was over a few days, and I think several artists contributed work to the, to the performance. She acted as a spirit guide that would guide visitors down this canyon trail um, in Malibu. So the site had been identified to build condos on, and you know, this was a sort of last ditch attempt to really um, bring people in contact with the land, show that the land um, had value and had a kind of consciousness of its own. I think you see Barbara with um, a plank on one arm and the, the angel wing on the other. So she's really a broken angel. She's acknowledging that this is going to be an uphill battle and ultimately they did build condos on the site. Um, and yet she's still really thinking of, of saving the land here. And um, to go back to the 70s, an early incredible piece, which is of course here in the show, in the, the, the beautiful show behind me, is the celebration of the Holy Squash, 1971. And this is such an incredible, I would say, um, joyous, uh, eternal, kind of perpetually growing and changing example of spiritual ecofeminist work. So, you know, she really kind of created a religion around this squash. And again, the writing that she gives us is so great. I want to just share a couple bits. But 
The relic of a communal meal, the shell of a large Hubbard squash, became to me a beautiful holy relic. I determined to create of it a religion and in the process embed in it resin to remain an object of reverence for centuries. Those who assisted became the disciples and converts. None were turned away. Over a 10 day period, a mold was built. Resin was cast around the sacred decaying hulk, creating a large, faintly purple lozenge. Mass was celebrated and the holy squash was baptized. It was dunked in the fountain on the campus of UC Irvine. So this was in February of 1971. It was her final show at UC Irvine. Um, and it really was the start of an ongoing series of work that kept returning to the squash over and over again. And of course, it's such a, a kind of feminine body-like object, the squash. I mean, I can imagine the, the latex and the kind of chemicals Barbara used weren't maybe necessarily the most ecological. But the idea and the shape of the squash is kind of like a birthing body. And of course, the little, the creative child that, that emerges from the cast um, is very feminine. And ultimately, you know, uh, it, it appears again and again in future works. And um, things like the seeds from the squash appear later in a piece, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, but I also really loved this quote, which is, the patriarchy is built on awe, fear, wonder, reward systems, approval, judgment, attention, secrecy, and sex. In an ideal world, a female religion would not supplant a male religion. It would be a complement to it. The bridge between the two is love. So this idea of a feminine, a kind of divine feminine that really um, is pervasive in Barbara's work is in line with a lot of ecological feminist thought. Um, you know, I think there are goddess cultures going way back and certainly in the 80s, sort of divine goddess worship figured prominently in the work of Judy Chicago is, is just one off the top of my head. Um, it's, it's interesting. It can be sort of an uncomfortable place for us, I think, in this 21st century frame of mind. Like, what do we do with it? And that's in my work as a curator, I'm always sort of grappling with what do I do with this sort of like goddess work. Um, but there's a real, I think, earnestness in Barbara's work that um, maybe it became, it started as playful or it began as this kind of... Um, communal event to produce the squash with her colleagues. And it, it's become, I think, quite serious um, again and again, the kind of spiritual divine of the feminine, dimension of the feminine divine. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as we move into the 80s, I think I'm just going to highlight a couple more works and then hopefully Janelle and Barbara would maybe add to the conversation. Um, radical land, radi, radial landspeak uh, was a ceremony honoring nature in which Barbara attempted to listen to the land speak and let the world fall away. This was a private performance. She performed with students um, near Redlands, I think it was uh, Menatoni area in Southern California. And the students all kind of spread out to different directions, the four cardinal directions. And with these large kind of red ribbons, they created um, this form in the earth, in this sort of washed out dry river basin. And you know, much of this uh, performance was inspired by Native American customs. Um, I think Barbara was working very closely with two Native Americans and the Native American teachers in the 1980s, uh, a Seneca medicine woman named Twyla Nitsch, and in the later 80s, Harley Swift Deer, who was of Navajo and Cherokee um, tribal affiliation. So during her kind of deep dive into indigenous cultures, indigenous ceremony, um, it really ended up influencing a lot of her performance work. And we see that, uh, especially in a work like this, where they're sort of honoring the land, they're creating runes in the earth, and of course, doing kind of meditation and blessing with the earth. So I'm gonna end with 21st Century Odyssey, and it was so great to see so much of the ephemera from this work on view in the gallery, which you all can see um, in the cases, I think on the left side of the gallery. 
This was an incredible, epic two-year project that Barbara undertook uh, between 1991 and 1993. Um, at the time, she was dating a doctor, a physicist, um, Roy Walford. And Roy Walford was one of the eight participants, they called them biospherians, to enter into the biosphere. So <laughs> I don't know how many of you remember this. Um, I was a child at the time, but I really remember it. So the biosphere was this kind of utopian experiment in sustaining life on Earth, but ultimately life on other planets as well. So a way to kind of see if humans could create this structure that would kind of metabolize its own systems. Um, it had five biomes, a rainforest, an ocean with a coral reef, a marsh, a desert, and a savanna. And it had farm with living plants and animals, and of course, living quarters. So Roy Walford, Barbara's partner at the time, was the sort of medic, the, the doctor on the team. Um, you can see him, I don't know if I have a pointer. You can see him here with the, the bald head on the, the left here. But Barbara and Roy became close collaborators in this project, which is really meant to um, flip the Odysseus myth on its head, whereas Roy would become the Penelope character, kind of stuck in this bi biosphere, um, weaving and unweaving every day his, his toils inside the biosphere. And Barbara would become the kind of great adventurer out in the world, really experiencing um, different cultures, different trials and tribulations before coming home. Um, I don't know if you can make this out, but I just love this list of things that Barbara was going to take with her. A 12-volt battery pack, a solar rig, um, you know, a year's worth of videotape. I mean, she was really going alone to document this voyage, and along the way, she would have to take all the kind of, like, equipment to make it happen. So during the voyage, she would have communication with the biosphere, um, through kind of an early proto-internet uh, teleconferencing system arranged by the Electronic Cafe International, which is sort of an early internet cafe located in Santa Monica and run by two artists, Kit Galloway and Sherry Rabinowitz. And they facilitated the communication between Barbara, who was all over the world. She was in India, Nepal, Thailand, Australia, Hawaii, and across the U.S., and London, Berlin, and Oslo also. Um, so they would kind of make this communication happen in this very, what now looks like a pretty archaic, um, not archaic, just very early, early technological way. I would love to show you guys some clips of that. Um, and of course there are more in the show. But first, Barbara and Roy discussing the project before they embark on it. <laughs> Biosphere. Well, that's a good question. You know, he's going to be in there for two years, and so um, I thought that um, in order to pass the time with a project that's equally interesting and actually augments what he's doing, I would take a trip around the world and as I travel, um, collect an oral story of my journey and uh, go to certain places that I've wanted to visit for a long time, do certain artworks on root rituals and things with people that I meet. And in key places, I would make phone calls and video phone calls to Roy and hear about what he's doing and um, what he, how will that work with you? Well, I'll be in the biosphere in isolated, uh, closed ecological space, right. kind of like a Penelope who was uh, wondering where Odysseus was at a particular right. time. <laughs> it was you in this role reversal right. in the present uh, instance. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know what I'll be doing exactly. Uh, enduring, perhaps, and learning, and thinking, and taking an interior trip, uh, somewhat matching metaphorically your exterior trip. 
just as in real life before this, I'm very experienced in exterior trips, being yeah. a world traveler, and being a performance artist, you're more experienced in interior trips. Yeah, that's right. That, that's basically the idea. And I'd be having a, a, an adventure like, say, Odysseus had and with his sailors and having various uh, threats and which become part of my um, spiritual awakening and eventually uh, threats, guides me Threats home. and seductions and yeah. everything. Right. The various, to some extent, the various stages of the voyages of Ulysses. And, and also it's going to be a form of, um, of prayer or worship of the planet that we rely on so heavily, just like Roy will be uh, totally relying on people he's in the biosphere with for their very lives. And the planets. Yes, the entire living system. Yeah. And it's the same idea on this journey that I will be really getting in touch with the fact that all the people on the Earth are part of our life system. And the variety of the people. And in certain places when I do uh, these key rituals, um, I will be using an object that's kind of like a bead or a seed. And my uh, phone calls, and, and we're going to use a small computer as well. Those will be like an electronic thread that will thread these prayer beads or mama, you know, around the globe. So um, that's the idea. Do you have any um, other questions? Oh, I, I was just thinking about you both getting and receiving energy from each other. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit of that a strange form of intimacy that can only be uh, created uh, in the electronic realm. We're really practicing to try to see how that can be worked out. And, and rather than being uh, separated and lonely, rather to have a new form of connecting. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so here's an example of what those transmissions would look like. <laughs> you guys are great. Barbara, you are fantastic. What? Well, he's, um, well, he's uh, fooling with the uh, leads. Um, I'll introduce you to Steve Wilkie. Oh, yeah, that's you're, sure. you're at his home. Roy, you're still on Roy, how are you? I'm fine, yeah. I, uh, Good. We're having uh, quite a treat here with Barbara and her uh, gadgetry, which is all over the floor of our house. Uh-huh. It's proving to be quite a treat for, for the locals who find to witness this. Roy, I wonder, uh, <clears throat> may sound like it's coming from a negative direction, but, but not so. wonder what, uh, in your experiments so far, have been anything in the way of what you might categorize as disappointment or as a unexpected result of the process that's underway at this time or anything that's popped up unexpected that you say, well, why didn't we think of that earlier? Well, I don't think there are any kind of major things. The only disappointment is we're getting positive and negative reactions from the press, and they kind of swing from one direction to the other. Uh, mm -hmm. That's hard to uh, sort of deal with. But outside of that, the biosphere itself is working uh, quite well. And we're get the idea. I mean, it was a very slow form of telecommunicating. Um, but it, it, watching this again, it strikes me, you know, that while Barbara is out there in the world really connecting with people and doing ritual performances and kind of gathering treasures on her way, leaving treasures, she took squash seeds, again, took squash seeds with her and would give those to people she met. Um, 
not, not to be critical of Roy, but he's sort of worried about his press and sort of like what people think of the biosphere. And um, no doubt they were doing incredibly important work. Um, there's an interesting documentary called Spaceship Earth, I believe, that really looks at that biosphere project and, and its um, ups and downs, let's just say. And so just kind of looking at um, some of the ways she fundraised, she would correspond with people who would donate to the project. This is one example of a letter that would be exchanged in the mail. Um, and I just love that it says, what am I doing to help heal the planet and create a peaceful world? I'm working very hard to heal myself from all the lies of society. You know, I think a lot of people, women, men included, um, we're working through this at that time, kind of early 90s, um, really doing some deep reflecting on that. And of course, uh, sponsors of the project received these performance reports, these periodic newspapers, really giving an update on the Odyssey. It was a, a, a kind of full production of printing, um, correspondence, the telecommunicating, and of course the work happening in the biosphere. I think all those elements really made this one of the more epic multifaceted works of, of Barbara's. Um, so maybe I'll stop there and take questions, but I also would really love to hear Barbara and Janelle's kind of reflection on a lot of this material. Um, they were so kind to ask me to contribute to the catalog. Um, and yeah, I think we should hear it straight from you guys. <laughs> so thank you. We have an extra microphone. Any questions? <laughs> Hold on, Barbara. Here's Barbara. It's really um, fun to go back to all these former artworks. And uh, of course, the Odyssey was an amazing um, piece. It was. See, the idea that for that one became, you know, we, when we were starting to do physical live art, there was a lot of issues that came, became relevant. And, and you know, my friend at F Space, Chris Burden, did these pieces where he would sit on a raised um, a platform that was in the corner of a room. Was out of, in other words, he was up there, we assume, and you could never see him, so you don't know if he was actually up there, but the idea was that he was gonna be there for, I guess, a week or something, and not eat and not, you know, get down. And so this whole thing of uh, duration, the, the, the piece had a, a, a um, dimension of a duration in time. And that was kind of a new idea as far as I was concerned, and I thought, huh. <laughs> And when I started to, you know, talk, and we, Roy was getting ready to, you know, we were talking about going to the biosphere and all that, and then he was chosen to go in. They had to choose their candidates for their different qualities that they could bring to the uh, incarceration in that thing. And so, anyway, he was chosen because he was a great deal older than the rest, and he, he wasn't sure whether, you know, he would qualify, but he, of course, is very fit, and. And he did qualify because of his science background. He's a doctor and all this. So anyway, so let's see, where was I going? Uh, um, oh, so the idea was um, we could, I thought of doing a, um, oh, the, the, the journey that I decided to take was partly this thing of creating a um, artwork that had a time dimension. It, it started on September 26, 1991, and the, it ended precisely on September 26, 1993. And that entire time, every single thing that happened in the world, in my life, everything, was part of the artwork. And so that was the sort of intellectual part of this piece. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Janelle, I know you watched all 
hundred hours of the footage, <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of hours of the telecommunication documentation, the performances she did in each country. Do you have any insights, I maybe, around her experience with the land and various lands all around the world and, and trying to heal the, the earth in some way? I think some of the things that really struck me in this piece that you made, Barbara, is um, not only that you chose to take a sort of chunk, in time, a chunk of time that matched the, what was in order, the closure and then the opening of Biosphere 2, uh, it's already, performance is already durational and somewhat challenging, right? Like there's pieces that you did for 12 hours, there's pieces that you did for a few days, but this one you said that you're gonna do a performance that will last two years and that everything you did, all moments of your life would essentially be the performance, whether that is doing an actual ritual performance in India or spending time with your family. And at this point in the early 90s, I mean, I'm a lady of a certain age, so I remember telecommunications. I remember life before email and phones. And this, what struck me mostly was that this was really an adventure that you struck out um, traveling the globe. It took a lot to organize all of that. I mean, really, it's a project of administration. You had to raise all the money. I mean, I went through boxes and boxes and boxes of the paperwork that you saved, because, of course, in your work you save, um, you, you keep record of everything you do. But that it was, like, hard. Yeah, Catherine, you showed this list. I mean you were carrying so much stuff, now we sort of go with our phone and a book and our rolly suitcase, and you had all of this equipment, which didn't work for a long time. Like when you first got to India, remember, it, there was like a power oh, surge. Oh, oh yeah, the, well, the computer didn't work. Right. Yeah, and, and, we, and we had one of the very first small portable computers because I couldn't, I wanted to carry one, but they didn't hardly exist. We found it was it, IT, what is that? IT. Oh, yeah. Internet, what? What? International. Yeah, international technology. I guess that was the brand it was, and uh, and so it was about the size of a. Uh, it's still pretty good size. Yeah, yeah. It was it was about that that yeah. thick, and and, um, and then we had to get we had the video phone, which is I don't know how the hell we came across this little invention that has not lasted because it's been supplanted by other equipment, but it's a little box. We have it in the show. Yeah, a little box, and the, uh, the, you know, I had one traveling. The international, uh, the uh, electronic. electronic cafe had one, and who else? And Roy, Roy had one. Yeah, and so we could triangulate, and we could, um, you know, figure a time where everyone was awake, and all, and then we, <laughs> And, and, it, and it didn't go through the electrical system, it went through the telephone system. Yeah. So you had to have a telephone line, and it couldn't go through a switchboard, it had to go directly out. All these were things that we've you know, found out in going. I didn't know it couldn't go through a switchboard, and then said, oh, we can't do that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Oh, very expensive. Yeah, very expensive. And so it was, um, yeah, completely an adventure. What was it? What well, the question was to me, and I threw it to you. But yeah, what, yeah. Did, what did you say? <laughs> and I don't think I answered your question so well, Catherine, but I mean, the, of course, like, Barbara's intention with 21st Century Odyssey was in part to travel to these places. She didn't go to, you know, all the time major cities, but to to meet people, to you know, be in the land, and to do these sorts of rituals that connected to, um, of course, what was a massive ecological experiment at Biosphere Two, uh, to places in India where there wasn't, you know, even um, they didn't even have electricity all the time, so she couldn't even run the performance, and then to what was a completely proto-internet cafe in Santa Monica. I mean, there's just so many disjunctions in a piece like this, but it is a century still this kind of, you know, odyssey, right? Like, why do humans go into, why do we travel? It's because we need to experience these other sorts of environments, right? So I'll cut myself off there. It's still maybe not answering your question. Yeah, thank you. Barbara. Barbara. <laughs> Hi. Well, uh, uh, this thing about the computer, 
I forgot to say, it, 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 for some reason, it wasn't working. And we tried to take it to, this is in Kathmandu, and we tried to take it to, there is computers and stuff up yeah. there, but we tried to take it, and they couldn't fix it. And so they, they well, they thought there was a place in, in India, you know, was, <laughs> that could fix it. Well, India is known for its uh, sort of technological wizardry anyway. So, <clears throat> so I had no choice but just give it to them. And it was sent down somewhere. And it was stayed there for, you know, a couple of weeks. And they brought it back. And would it work? And it did, <laughs> which is the great thing. But it was, the whole thing was very... Uh, Tenuous. Yes, yes. I, was, I could tell many stories. It was just, oh, I know. Oh, the other thing I was saying. OK, Roy. Roy had been, um, um, he's a very innovative, out-of-the-box thinker. And he had already traveled in India emulating these sadhus that go around in loincloths and, a, <laughs> and a, a hiking stick, you know? And so he thought that I hadn't been anywhere. And he thought, no, you, you're not even an adult until you get out of this country and, tr you know, travel. You've got to travel. And so that was part of the agenda. Sure, I will. And I, I mean, it's true. I mean, I'm a different person having done that. I think I read that Roy was uh, known for his longevity work in medicine for restricting calories. And indeed, he lost a lot of weight in the biosphere and kind of, yeah, there was sort of a, a dark side to the biosphere as well. Angela. <laughs> um, I have a question. I'm so curious what happened after those two years, two years when you guys reunited after both of your external and sort of internal journeys. Like, oh, how was it? I'm curious what happened when you guys reunited after those two years, where you both had such vastly different journeys internally and externally. Well, there's a good story. Uh, <laughs> story time. Barbara, what happened when the biosphere opened back up? With well, well, in the first place, we weren't exactly uh, romantic lovers. We were sort of lovers because of our love of adventure, you know, and, and we... But, but I, I never fell in love with him, and I don't think he fell in love with me, but we were mates, I guess. And then, so, and then he was very annoying, I mean, you know? <laughs> and I guess I was to him, and so, so the, the, but, but we did it, you know? And, and that's the main thing, that, that, that it was the journey that kept us together. So here we are. And finally, and we'd, we'd communicate back and forth via computer and stuff. And so finally, I was realizing, gosh, you know, we've really kind of broken up. What are we going to do? We're, I'm still, I may be in, in Norway or somewhere by now. Or, or, and, and well, we'll just have to, because we were going to have an event when we came back. But now we're broken up. What do we do? So, so uh, well, we just planned, well, we'll just have the event and we'll just do the best we can. So when he came, we... When I met him first at the um, opening of the biosphere, it was very wonderful, you know, because it was such a, an incredible two years. But then there was this event at Electronic Cafe, which had facilitated our communications in, in um, LA, and uh, it was a dinner. And so he and I had to get up and greet people. <laughs> And, and we look like we're zombies that we could hardly stand talking t next to each other. And we just did our dutiful thing. <laughs> we were obviously... In the name of performance? Yeah, in the name of the piece. But we were not... Anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Professionals. I like that. Are there other questions? Or any thoughts about ecofeminism? I think everybody here kind of knows each other. Yeah, Carmen. Hi. <laughs> um, I have a question for, for you, Barbara, about integration and thinking about your practice. So before you went into like this, this, this journey out in the world, um, 
I was wondering if you saw, like, let's say, like, your, like there was, like, a, you know, like, the durational performance might have been 12 hours, but then life was sort of separate from that. And then to hear you speak about how this, um, in your travels, it all became part of the work and part of the art. Do you feel that after the traveling, there was a, a, a sense of um, integration that was different than before? And if you could speak to that. Well, on the one hand, the early performances were um, uh, me reclaim or integrate. They were transformational pieces that reintegrated myself because I had been had a shattering experience with a family thing, and I was a kind of broken person when I started doing the pieces, and and the artwork actually brought me back together. And so that had a culminating piece. That, that the culminating of that was the birthdays piece. I don't know if you know that. And then after that, I thought, now what? And I got involved with um, big ecological pro projects like the saving of the Los, Ange the Los Angeles River piece and things like that. And then, uh, um, and then we, and then we, what comes? After birthdays? No, after the uh, environmental pieces that were the big, uh, at the, um, the river. The yeah. river, uh-huh. Well, and the wetlands, yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and that was all in, about the environment. And I got very much, and, and the whole thing was the identification of my being and the earth. And I studied with these Native American teachers. It was, you know, that was fantastic for about three or four years. And it was amazing. And so you get really grounded because they are coming from the earth as they do their work. They're not intellectually <laughs> deciding to do, I think I'll do this or that. It's, they're, they're coming from a completely different place. And I got more in touch with that part of it myself. Oh, I see. Well, <clears throat> no, art isn't separated as an exclusive thing in that kind of situation. I know it's not making paintings to sell, and it's not. It's it's more like the actions to create meaning, I guess. Yeah. Maybe one question from Albert, and then we can. Yeah. This is a maybe debatably semi-philosophical question. So uh, I've always revered your work. And um, yeah, so we're seeing a, a juncture uh, in environmental activism, uh, particularly in the context of the art world. So like we're seeing like environmental activism, which is fundamentally violent in nature, like stop oils, you know, defacing of artworks in the museum setting, which is one way of approaching it. But your, your work is really incredible because it's environment activism from a healing standpoint that's not predicated on like this violent like interjection. And, and then, um, so the question is, both are interesting ways of like bringing awareness about the environment and the concept of like, we live in a very fast paced environment where, you know, time is, you know, capitalistic. So do you see like those two environmental practices, uh, performance, arguably performance, like being able to meet together or they're always gonna be very separate because some people are very, like environmental activism is like about like expediting like this very doomsday, like end of the world, trying to bring awareness and yours is like from a very healing perspective that is much more meditative, but some people might argue not quite as like in your face approach. So very curious about that. And what was, uh, he's, he's asking, um, comparing your work, which is very healing of the earth, mm -hmm. to some, especially recent environmental actions where people are damaging artwork to make a big statement about mm -hmm. extractive policies mm -hmm. and things like that. 
And, and you're asking if you see any kind of um, a coming together of that? Am I getting this right? Like is, compatible or are they compatible? Can you can you bring oh, okay. together sort of more aggressive <laughs> some of it, actions with more of these healing yeah, actions that you've yeah. done? Some of uh, some of the work is um, I wish uh, activism that's um, aggressive. I can't. I haven't got the right word. There's a word, an art word for it, but like gorilla, like gorilla huh? Action. Gorilla action. Yeah, I like that. But and and <clears throat> and then and then there's. Um, like he was saying, more meditative healing, healing, which is what you've done. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I, I, I think you need both. I mean, um, I, I could be a, an, an activist in the right circumstances. You know, I could, you know spoil someone's work or something because I thought it was wrong. Um, but, and, but in terms of the, how they merge, um, I, like who, who's famous? Um, More clues. Um, painters who... who? Done the gorilla environment. Uh huh. I mean, I even know some of them. I can't think of their names. Some because it's I'm so old. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I mean, even some of the art defacements. I mean, of course, it's not even brand brand new, right? Like no, been no. happening for so long. But I don't know. Like, it's very it's, weird. It's a very weird. It just weird seems way. so. It's like it's, it's so tricky, right? Like you get it, but it seems so incredibly misguided. Yeah. In a sense, in that artist. But it's interesting the idea of intervention. I mean, he thinks yeah. he's is an intervention. That's the one I'm thinking. Intervention. Yeah. Intervention, yeah. yeah. Right. Banksy, is that who's? Banksy's an example. But he doesn't do, like, necessarily environmentally but specific ones, but stop oil is but definitely. Like, writing focused. stop oil on the. Yeah, yes. I think it's, it's probably, Barbara, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but they're. You just said there's different approaches, and they're yeah. somewhat sympathetic, right? I mean, everybody, it's actually like the same, same goal. Same, you know, same, same yeah, just how do we... I mean, it's interesting because, you know, right now, you know, a lot of people look at, you know, look at the headlines about multiple wars, and we're talking about just the climate change war. Yeah. I mean, that's environmentally destructive. Yeah. <laughs> war is the most environmentally I mean, just look at, like, the amount of, like, Force. I mean, that just... I don't believe in war. No. <laughs> Definitely. Kind of a more like aggressive, just like what you're talking about is much more like aggressive and much more, you know, like I mean, violent. violent. But I mean, capitalism fundamentally is. Good sure, well. but like thinking about it in relation, I'm bringing it up and like circling back to the conversation because I actually think that's really like, yes. really points to like those two worlds yeah. in a really interesting way. Interesting yeah, like both are kind of approaching it, but from like, you know, the eco feminism, I've been always thought of as, or like, you know, thinking about it and relays to so much of how your, some of your environmental work has played to, and then this seems like very much like, I'm going to destroy something. Do you under, does, does that make sense, what I'm saying? Well, I'm, I'm relating it back to like, kind of how Catherine was talking about your work as being something as healing, that's like a connection to eco-feminism, or like a feminist approach, versus a, like an aggressive patriarchal approach. But, but the, the <laughs> well, maybe we'll maybe we should maybe yeah maybe we should wrap this up and chat chat a bit. Can I say something, Catherine? Um, I think the work that you've done on ecofeminism and continue to do, and you've been working on this big exhibition. I just want to thank you so much for bringing this attention <laughs> to to the work. We all, we all know you've been working on this exhibition and, and it will be upcoming, but that um, also because I knew this work you've been doing and when I started to dive more into what Barbara's been making for so many years that she really ha hasn't been written about so much. This, this large chunk of your work, Barbara, which took place over a couple of decades and it continues in a sensibility, but that you brought attention to it and I thank you so much and you've written for the catalog and I think there'll be a lot more 
to attention to thank you. to this. So yes. I just want to thank and you. Thank and, you and, maybe, and maybe yeah. we can all sort of anybody wants to hang out for just a little bit chat kind of yeah. informally without mics and stuff yeah. if it's okay. Thank you all for coming you, on Oscar. Wednesday. Amazing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone.